The next paper is Ionization Interchange Between the Ionosphere and Plasmosphere and Substorm Effects on the F Region by Chung Park. Okay, this uh, slide shows the plasmosphere in its two extreme states. The top one is the, uh, I can't see it very well from here. The one at the top shows the uh, quiet time plasmosphere in its puffed up state with uh, the plasma pause at L equals seven. And the bottom one shows the storm time plasmosphere with the uh, plasma pause at L equals two. Uh, we have been, for some time now, concerned about the question of how the plasma sphere goes from one state to the other, and how this dynamic change in the plasma sphere may be related to what goes on in the underlying ionosphere. I think we have a pretty good understanding now of how the plasma sphere goes from this state to this state, how it recovers from the magnetic storm effects. We don't understand very well yet how the diverse process works. We have depended very heavily on our Whistler data from uh, eight station in Antarctic for this kind of study. Uh, unfortunately, that station was closed in 1965, but since then we went back to that same area and established a new station at uh, Saipo and we just received the shipment of large block of data, which I hope will help us answer the remaining questions. The recovery from this state to this state occurs by filling from the ionosphere. This depleted region here fills up from plasma uh, flowing upward from the ionosphere on the day side, and then when the plasma rotates onto the night side, they're partially drained into the ionosphere to help maintain the nighttime ionosphere. But the draining on the night side is less than filling on the day side, so that there is a net increase in plasma content during the recovery process until the density level in the plasma sphere reaches a certain level where it just saturates and doesn't increase any further. Um, I think the next slide illustrates this better. Uh, let's just look at the top part first. Uh, this is deduced from Whistler's recorded at H station. I have plotted the tube content, plasma tube content here as a function of L value. And this curve shows the tube content profile after it had one day to recover from a magnetic storm. Then the second day, it recovers to this level, third day, fourth day, and on to the eighth day. And one thing you can notice right away is this apparent saturation level. So at any given point, the uh, tube content uh, keeps on increasing until it reaches this level. And at this level, the nighttime draining and the daytime filling balance each other out, so there is uh, no further net increase. And there is a, a remarkably well-defined boundary separating the two regions, the inner plasma sphere, where this plasma is in a diurnal average sense in equilibrium with the ionosphere, and the outer plasma sphere, which is still filling up from the ionosphere. And notice that uh, this uh, demarcation line is at uh, L equals 2.5 after one day of recovery, and it moves out to L equals 4 uh, after eight days of recovery. So it is a very slow process, and eight days is a pretty long time in the life of the magnetosphere. There are bound to be some uh, disturbances, substorm activities, which will tend to deplete the plasma sphere again and push this demarcation level further inward. So this uh, demarcation between the inner and the outer plasma sphere appears to be more or less a permanent feature of the plasma sphere. The, uh, the other process, of, uh, this bottom one is simply uh, the result of translating this into electron densities at the equatorial plane. The, the other process um, 
of how the plasma sphere gets depleted during disturbances is not well understood. We only know bits and pieces which uh, have yet to be pieced together. Um, I believe there are several processes involved in the depletion of the plasma sphere. One would be the uh, peeling off of the plasma sphere by convection electric fields, which uh, I'm sure Rick Chappell and perhaps also others will discuss later on in this <coughs> at this conference. There is another important process, which is the dumping of the plasma into the underlying ionosphere. And uh, these two processes uh, may go on simultaneously at different local times. Uh, we don't know how this local time regime is carved up by these two different processes, but I believe it, uh, the, the peeling off process probably works in the late afternoon local time sector, whereas the dumping into the ionosphere uh, operates in the night time and, and morning, uh, night and morning sector. Uh, I'll show you one example of this uh, dump, plasma dumping into the ionosphere. This one shows, uh, this again comes from the Whistler data. So this is a tube content uh, profile before a rather isolated substorm activity. Just started out with this. And uh, a few hours after, uh, after a uh, substorm activity, uh, we had a profile looking like this. And all of this is inside the plasma pulse. The plasma pulse would be sitting uh, farther out. Our liquid is five and a half or six, perhaps. And uh, from detailed uh, analysis of the Whistler data, which I won't go into here, uh, we could deduce that uh, the process actually occurred this way. It started out with this initial profile which was shoved inward by westward electric field. So you would have a profile looking uh, as this dashed curve. But this was combined with a downward flow into the ionosphere. So the end result was this. Uh, this is consistent with the observations of the uh, ionospheric F layer, which uh, is shown in this slide. This shows FOF2 as a function of local time, and this is the same substorm event uh, shown in the previous slide. You can see large enhancements in FOF2 at Ottawa, uh, which uh, is in the same uh, meridian sector as where the Whistler data was uh, taken. Uh, this is just one example of strong coupling between the ionosphere and the magnetosphere. Uh, this uh, dynamical processes of the coupled uh, ionosphere plasmasphere system is under very strong influence of the geomagnetic activity. During disturbances, the plasmasphere uh, generally gets depleted of its plasma. And then following that, the plasma sphere fills up again from uh, fluxes coming from the ionosphere. Uh, at the same time, there's enhanced precipitation of uh, energetic particles into the ionosphere and also heating during these magnetic disturbances. So the, uh, during this uh, substorm activity, the ionosphere sees enhanced influx of both cold particles and hot particles and also, uh, also heat. And the ionosphere responds to all of this in a very complicated way. Um, the, and the parameters that you observe in the ionosphere are often difficult to interpret because these parameters are the results of uh, several competing processes. So we need uh, a great deal uh, more theoretical work coupled with simultaneous observations of the ionosphere and the plasma sphere to start sorting these things out. And Peter Banks and I just started a theoretical work um, in which we solved the uh, continuity equation for O plus and H plus. And uh, we wanted to see how the coupled ionosphere plasma sphere system responds to electric fields and neutral winds and so on. 
And the results you get are quite different from the results you would obtain by considering the ionosphere alone. Uh, for example, if you, uh, if you just consider the ionosphere, and if you imagine you push the ionosphere down to lower altitudes, you would expect the recombination losses to increase. Therefore, you would predict uh, lower electron densities. Uh, if you consider the coupled system, however, this is not necessarily true. Because as you push the ionosphere down, it also induces uh, enhanced downward flow from the plasma sphere, which has plenty of plasma to, to feed the ionosphere. And the <coughs> result could be that you see an increased electron density as the ionosphere is pushed downward. Uh, this is illustrated in, and there, there is one other important point, uh, that the electric fields and neutral winds have different effects on the uh, coupled ionosphere plasma sphere system. Whereas if you just consider the ionosphere, uh, the two will have the same effect as long as the vertical drift velocity is the same. And the next slide, shows this theoretical uh, result where on the left hand side uh, we uh, turned on an electric field at t equals zero and we let the neutral wind to be constant and as a result the uh, vertical drift velocity has a shape like this and this electric field, which is a westward electric field, drives the plasma inward from L equals 4 to L equals 3 in about an hour or so. And because the two volume changes, you see an increase in the plasma spheric density at 3,000 kilometer level. And this westward electric field pushes the F2 layer peak down from 350 kilometers to about 300 kilometers. Uh, I haven't plotted the downward flux of plasma but the flux uh, coming down from the uh, plasma sphere is sufficiently large to, well, it's more than enough to compensate for the increased losses. So the peak density in the F layer actually increases as the layer is pushed down. Uh, on, on this side, we show the effect of the neutral wind. The electric field is constant, and the neutral wind uh, has a step function. So the resulting vertical drift velocity is almost identical to this case, but here there is no convection in the magnetosphere, no plasma squeezing. So the plasma spheric density stays constant. The F layer peak moves downward, just as in this case, in response to this change in vertical drift velocity. But in this case, the uh, enhanced downward flux is not quite enough to compensate for the increased losses. So you see a slight decrease in the peak density. Um, there's, see, the last slide shows an experimental result. This is the bottom side F, uh, NH profile uh, on the night side uh, from Wallops Island during a substorm activity. Uh, 1.30 local time, we had a profile looking like this and two o'clock, we have this. Uh, we have, have profiles shown every half hour. And as the, prof as the ionosphere is lowered, you initially see an increase in peak density until you reach some point. Uh, in this case, it was about 280 kilometers or so. If you push it further down enough, then the uh, recombination loss increases so fast that the uh, downward flux can't cope with it anymore. So, if you push it down far enough, then you see a decrease. This is consistent with uh, what we predicted from the uh, theoretical study. I have only half a minute left, so I'll stop here. The calculation that you uh, made with the electric field on it showed an increase in NMF2 by the time you got down to L equals 3, well, actually, it sort of continued. And the other one that you show here shows a decrease in NMF2 if you, if you just yes. turn the wind on. Now, unfortunately, what you observe is something at a fixed position where it increases with time. And you say, uh, are you suggesting it's a combination of drift and, and uh, 
Neutral winds, or what are you saying, John, that you think does it? It doesn't demonstrate, uh, do not demonstrate that at a fixed location you get into the uh, Yes, o o okay. Uh, th there, there could have been horizontal gradient uh, in the ionosphere. In the electric field case, you can just move different the blobs of plasma into the point of observation. Uh, so one case study like that doesn't really prove anything. But if you look at enough data, the consistency does support that interpretation. But I didn't have time to show off 10 cases. Yeah. Well, this, this is related to Bill's question. In this slide here, we see the HMF2 start to decrease. This well, case? Yes. At some time before, NMF2 begins to increase, whereas on the data, it seemed the, in, the decrease in the height began about the same time as the increase in density. Uh, or am I just well, looking at it? Well, the data, uh, well, I assume the step function in the electric field. Mm -hmm. uh, in reality, electric field may not change this fast. That's one thing. And in the data, the, the beginning of the data I showed, 130 uh, local time, uh, may not coincide with this point. The reason for this delay is the, the downward flux uh, increases right away as soon as the, uh, the layer is pushed down. But it, it takes for the plasma to diffuse down to the F2 layer. That's the reason for this delay. I think if you, you uh, assume a more realistic uh, electric field with some uh, uh, slope rather than a step function, then I think this time delay may be less. Uh, you actually got a number on there. Should that be 10 to the 4th or NMF2 or 10 to the 5th? Uh, I believe it's 10 to the 5. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is the magnitude of the downward H plus flux during this time, say at 1,000 kilometers or something of this altitude? Uh, we've, we've seen some cases where the downward flux was estimated to be as large as 10 to the 9 electrons per square centimeter per second. You mean from observational data or from the calculation? Uh, from observation. Yeah, right. I want to try to get people who haven't been heard from before. If I can. Jim Birch. Uh, I have a simple question, I think. Uh, I understand. I can see how if you increase the westward electric field, you're going to drive plasma in close to the Earth, and you're going to strip it away around and maybe out the magnetosphere. But I, I don't understand the mechanism that increases the downward flow velocity over what it was before. Downward flow velocity. Oh, the, the qualitative mechanism works uh, something like this. Uh, let's say you have H plus. Uh, that shouldn't be H plus, it should be O plus. And let's say you have a H plus profile looking like this. Now there's some uh, critical level here below which O plus and H plus will be in chemical equilibrium. Now when you push the whole plasma downward, you tend to push the O plus profile like this and H plus profile like this. Now, uh, if you look at the region below the uh, critical level where the O plus and H plus should be in equilibrium, chemical equilibrium, the O plus concentration has decreased. Therefore, H plus concentration uh, must decrease by the same proportion. So you end up with a profile, H plus profile that looks like this. And it is this gradient that pulls in more, more flux from above. Oh, it, it's just that assumed. Was about, that, was right? yeah. that was a theoretical calculation, yeah, so we just assumed it. Not in the ionosphere. Yeah, the Whistler people usually tend to plot their electric fields out at the equator rather than down in the ionosphere. That does make them look a little different. Right, I, I will take suspicion. <laughs>